Hello YouTube, this is Morgan, Airspeed Prime, here at my next Avatar Weekly Discussion Topic video. This one is going to be my Missed Opportunities video for Book 1 Air, the last one of Korra. And uh, yeah, let's just get straight into it. Uh, as ever, I'll start with the positives I have of Book 1, then get into the Missed Opportunities criticisms. So, what I really like about Book 1 is that I do feel it is an overall really good um, exploration of the characters, introducing them to us for the first time. Uh, you know, having the team form together, I think the kind of initial kind of pro-bending arc and how, you know, we kind of come in and out of that as we get the first interactions with Amon works really well. And then the second half of the season obviously is more, much more serious, setting up the big things happening. I think in general that works. One of the other main things I like about book one is the general atmosphere of the book. I think it it has that as a huge positive over, I think, all of the other books of um, Korra. Just this feeling of um, mystery that you don't know exactly what's going on. You are wondering for most of the book, kind of like who or what Amon actually is. What are his powers? How is this working? And you get all of these kind of big moments. I think book one has a lot of like wow, did that just happen moments? Um, the Asami turn on her father, that's a big moment. Um, you know, T Tarlock, you know, obviously kind of going evil. Um, the big moment where just Tarlock is taken out by Amon, that came out of, like, I feel like, what? what? Uh, the reveal that, like, Tarlock and Amon are brothers, the backstory and how that reveals the kind of origins of that stuff. That all works exceptionally well. And, and as well as that, how that... Tarlock and Amon are brothers story ties in to Aang's kind of conflict with the Akone and how that kind of creates an aspect of Amon as a character, how it kind of created the that family's kind of quest for revenge, the curse of that family and wanted to get revenge. It all works exceptionally well because that backstory episode, Skeletons in the Closet, brings it all together so well. Um, I I like kind of Korra's character arc here in that this is just the arc where she kind of just gets to be the Avatar for the first time. I think reflecting on it now, the fact that she gets her bending back thanks to Aang and her first real connection to the Avatar state, uh, Avatar spirit, works because she, the whole point of the arc was that she finally got that connection. And then when she gets it, her reward is that do you know what? The Avatar State can actually help you with some things because there there is this kind of wellspring of knowledge that you have just based on the Avatar State. So she has that. And then book two acts as the what happens if that's not there to get you out of a really tough situation? Korra has to do it on her own. So I think book one and two actually work quite well together in that sense. So I do really like that. Um, I, I, I actually do think like reflecting on it Mako and Korra's kind of getting together as a couple is actually like they're just their relationship is fine. There's obviously some issues with the how they eventually kind of got to that road and all the other rem relationship drama and stuff like that that they had. But in general, I did like that. I think you know um, other stuff like uh, Tenzin and Korra, the start of that kind of mentor student relationship is is well done. I think the fact that you basically have Amon as the villain and then Tarlock as the kind of uh, ends up being a secondary villain that works really well because you have kind of Korra at conflict with kind of so many different people that it's um it creates a in really interesting dynamic from the end of the book um, and just a lot of different things like that it, it, it the way it introduced technology um and I, I don't feel they went overboard with it in book one um but in general I will say about book one I don't have too many major complaints with book one. Like I say, I, I say my overall complaint is just that it because it is only twelve episodes. It's the shortest book. Just at the end, it does struggle a little bit because of that length. That it just falls a little short. We don't quite get the explanations we perhaps need towards the end, as I'll get into. But I overall like. I think it, book one is like really, really solid in the way it's written overall. You can tell it's, you know, very much was meant to kind of be a thing on its own. And they kind of roughly changed it around a little bit towards the end to kind of lead on to something more. Um, but overall, I, I, I think it's very solid. So let's get into some of the criticisms. 
Um, I think the main criticism, as I just said there, uh, this is a 12 episode book and it was initially kind of meant to be the only book of Korra that we got. So the problem I would actually have with this is that some of the stuff right towards the end of the book comes together okay, you know, the defeat of Amon, fine, Amon and Tarlock are killed. What needed more explanation was Amon's power. They needed to, at some point, have someone explain what exactly his power did to people and why only the Avatar, using an Avatar kind of state energy bending technique, can give people their bending back. I feel you could have done this via an explanation with Katara. Maybe Katara just explains that, Korra, I've done all the like analysis I can on you. I can't fix this. I know what the problem is with regards to why you, you're bending, you can't bend anymore. But I can't fix it. This was done by a really powerful bloodbender who basically did really like intrinsic uh, bloodbending kind of within you and basically chi blocked you from within blocking your chi paths directly um, and I can't help that because that I am not that sort of a, you know intrinsic uh, bloodbender. They needed to have some sort of an explanation come out for that and have it just be this moment where the, pe- the two people who could have potentially healed her Tarlock and Mon are gone. The death of them is kind of like the last chance for Korra. And so when she has that moment at the end where she where she kind of goes out, has the connection with Aang, that's a really big thing because Aang kind of shows her that the power of the Avatar, there's something more to it than that. That in the end, Amon created his ability because he wanted to have an ability on the level of the Avatar's ability to take bending away. And here's the kind of an Avatar basically showing you that, look, we can actually reverse this. This is the the true power of the Avatar, you know, energy bending. We can actually reverse that process. And because you've now made this connection, you can do that. You've made this sacrifice in the battle against Amon. We can bring that back. Just needed, I think, the explanation. Because as it is in the show, you're left with just like, okay, Amon did something to them. It must have something to do with blood bending, but we don't get an explanation for what the technique actually does. And it was left for Mike and Brian to explain it to us afterwards what exactly that technique actually did. Whereas I think, as I said, you had the Katara scene. I think Katara could have explained, at least in a very minor capacity, what exactly was wrong with Korra. Um, so that's one thing. Um, with regards to Amon, I think his backstory is really good i wish more of the villains they covered the backstory in the same way that they did with amon there are little bits where like you kind of go back and forth on like well maybe they could have done this maybe they could have done that the bits i would highlight would be that i would have liked to have seen how he came to develop his you know block bending takeaway bending blood bending technique and like what exactly like he obviously that was part of his goal leaving was to find some way to kind of get revenge against bending and develop a power on the level of the avatar's ability to take bending away but how exactly did he go about doing that then where did the mask come from where did the story behind why he could get the equalist behind him come from how did he come to uh, lead the equalist how did he meet hiroshi they're the final little bits and pieces of amon's kind of to fully connect his story together that we needed and that we didn't quite get i don't think the book doesn't work or anything like that because we don't have this information in that I think the only one that I in any way consider like somewhat important would be that I would have liked to have seen how Hiroshi and Amon came to meet each other and with regards to that like did one have a greater influence over the other did like Amon meet a still grieving Hiroshi after the death of his uh, his wife and Amon put all this kind of planted all these seeds in his head and that was why Hiroshi kind of became the kind of almost zealot for the equalist movement that he did or was it almost the other way around that Hiroshi's passion because of what happened to him brought Amon more into play that's the only thing I think that was like they missed a little bit of the mark of kind of highlighting that relationship between Amon and Hiroshi more the background of the equalist movement that they should have done um, and, on a, and on a minor note to that, I think they could have done a little bit of a better job at, in the other books of the show, 
showing us that the equalist movement isn't fully gone, that it's still out there, but maybe not as big as it was before, that without him on, the movement didn't have as much to it without him or Hiroshi. Um, the video game obviously covers the equalists to some extent, showing that they survive book one and are even active after book two because the the, the book t- the core video game is set between book two and three. Um, so the the idea basically is that currently the equalists are still a thing. They're just so um, low down in power after their defeat. Um, in book one and also their defeat again in the core video game that they are basically on the level of the triads so that's why we're hoping that in the upcoming core comics that they mention the triads that the equalist will kind of be included as a bending triad a non-bending triad but uh, yeah that's just something with I I think mainly the other books that they kind of should have shown that there was that Um, but maybe you know book one could have done something where they they kind of did something more within the government to kind of open things up more towards a um, the non-benders. Now, they roughly do that in that, obviously, they elect... Raiko is elected as the president. They change the way that the, the leadership structure of the United Republic works. Uh, and the people elect Raiko, a non-bender, as the president. And I think that's, to some extent, meant to be the kind of big thing that because you have a non-bender as president, he is looking out for benders and non-benders, and that removes a lot of the problems. And the only issue between benders and non-benders that's left is just the uh, the fact that you know some people are benders, some people aren't, some people have a power, some people don't, and that creates a divide. But it's not huge because most benders don't try to actively, you know. Uh, show that uh, above people so there's that um next uh, missed opportunity would be i think a sami i will go on record here saying uh, book one is a sami's best book as a character um and as i said in the last video for book two her arc really comes down to book one and book four and it's all basically completely based around her father it's the really cool moment here where she sides against her father her last remaining family member whereas you had the whole moment of like you'd think that she'd just be loyal to him and couldn't accept what he that he was actually the evil guy but he she made the right decision and joined her friends against him and that was a really cool moment i think you should have emphasized that arc a little more to get across how much she was putting her kind of self out there on the line to do this that this is that like why she cares um why she doesn't feel as strongly as Hiroshi about what happened to her. Like, show her understanding of the thi- of the things better and really highlight that difference in opinion. They they get it across okay, definitely. They should have emphasized it a bit more because this was her main arc. Because as I said, it doesn't really get up to a lot in book two. And they tried to do something with Varric. Book three, she her individually she's not really doing anything all that much and in book four it's the return of her kind of relationship with Hiroshi and kind of ending that side of things the only problem here is that the way they used Asami here it was basically like Asami evolved in the romance aspect of the story and the her father side of the story we outside of her you know combat abilities and inventing abilities we never really got to know her as a as a character as a personality and i still think that even to some extent like after four books of knowing her a little bit we still don't know her all that well because the romances that she was involved in were the ones that were always really shortly uh, only given a short amount of time and so i think Korra and asami their relationship given that they're going to focus on it one of the things that it has to accomplish is getting to know a Sammy on a deeper emotional level and really kind of what drives her. Um, so so that, that's the only thing, that a Sammy has some really cool moments here. It's just her personality, her characterization doesn't come across as well as it perhaps should have. And I think she is kind of affected by the, the introductory book not giving her the kind of groundwork that she needs for the other books and that they after this don't really use utilize her all that well as a character and um, so that's another thing there uh, on a similar front uh, Bolin I think they also should have um, 
try to try to emphasize his arc a little more. Um, his is even less emphasized than Asami's, but you can see it just by looking at like some of the early scenes in the book uh, versus some of the later scenes in the book. That this is the arc of Bolin kind of being able to do stuff on his own and not rely on Mako to kind of help him or bail him out of situations. You can see this by the by the way when he's captured and he's given the chance to fight against Amon to keep his bending. He doesn't even try. That's how terrified he is in this real combat situation. He can't even bring himself to fight. Whereas Mako and Korra, you know, are getting involved in the action and can do that from the get-go. Versus the end of the book where you have Bolin rushing in on Naga they're doing some really cool earthbending to try and save Asami, getting involved in the fight, he's found his kind of bravery, he's a member of Team Avatar, and it's that kind of, he becomes, he makes his first step on the path to kind of becoming, I suppose, the hero type character he becomes over the course of the series. Um, The only thing is that they don't emphasize it all that much, outside of the fact that, oh, Bolin's come in to help, they don't in, no one, no, none of the characters recognize that Bolin has actually really developed as a character over the book, whereas it's just a kind of thing we as the audience can note that has happened to him as opposed to the show in any way trying to present a development arc for him. He's just kind of there and thereabouts again. They, they utilize him in the romance arc a little bit, um, and then they kind of come out of it, and they just kind of sort of end up he he definitely is a character who doesn't really have much of a character arc in this first book and it's really weird what happens from here in that Bolin is kind of nothing as a character almost this book Mako has had a lot going on because he's been like the main character almost involved in the romances and has had some big moments and where they go from here is just a complete 180 by the end of the series it's like Bolin has had all this development people really like Bolin as a character and Mako's the one who were kind of going like what happened to Mako where was Mako's arc in the book uh he has some fans a lot of people tend to not like him like it's such a shift that happened from here and it's really interesting to look back on book one and be like Bolin didn't really have a lot going on he was fun and and the character that we like of course but in terms of a character arc he didn't really have one here so there's that now, I think the w- one of the main things people expect me to go into after the lengthy rant in the part in the book two video about the romance is for me to really heavily go into the romances on book one. Unfortunately, I uh, I had a moment basically uh, about a year or two ago when I rewatched uh, most of book one. I don't actually mind the romance in book one all that much. I think it's actually fairly well kept to its own side plot. It's not addressed in like a ton of episodes. It's not really brought to the forefront all that much. And ends up resolving itself relatively well. Without too much like suffering from most of the characters. And the reason I say that is because look at the book. Almost all of the romance stuff happens in episode 5. They confine most of it to one episode. There's obviously a little bit before as you kind of get Mako and Asami together. You had Korra and Mako make their big connection in episode 3. But nothing romantically quite happened. And then like you know after that like just before Mako and Korra have a chance to maybe naturally come together as a couple. Like literally Asami is kind of like bumped into the store. Bumps into Mako. Asks him out on a date. Their relationship starts. Create a little kind of rivalry between the girls. But then you immediately kind of say it's not a thing and then basically the drama just happens in episode 5 the drama comes up and is resolved in episode 5 then after that you just have Korra get kidnapped Mako realizes he cares more for Korra than he does for Asami he breaks up with Asami and you and Korra and Mako get together at the end of the book the stuff in between episode 5 and the, the end scene end scene is very kind of minor scenes it's the end of the episode after Korra returns uh, when, at the end of 109 it's a scene in episode 11 I believe and that's basically it for the romance it's not as big of a plot point as people think um, and I think as well as that a lot of the scenes are actually written reasonably well again I will say the overall emphasis is on the drama side of things but 
it's not as like just brutally bad like with the aim that they're going for the way it's written as the book two stuff which for me exists purely for drama adds nothing to the book and is just all in all kind of not needed here it like it's like okay we're just establishing this and it's 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 working okay and I did actually I do think that Mako and Cora's relationship is actually really interesting because you see that they work well together in episode three you see throughout kind of how much they do care for each other and I think it comes together quite nicely is it the best developed relationship of all time no but for a you know 12 episode season bringing a couple together it worked fairly good they just obviously mess up handling relationships um in book two from here on out so only minor issues with the romance for me uh on this front i really don't feel too strongly either way about it in book one i think it's reasonably well done just a few little niggles here and there um i actually i with regards to 105 the spirit of competition i think it's actually a really well written episode because you the the duality of the relationship between the fire ferrets um as people versus how that then adapts to them being in the tournament in the pro bending arena that when they all think that their relationships are going great they're an amazing team then you gradually see like the the issue between Cora and Mako come up and they're not working well together but Bolin is feeling great because he had a he thought he had a great date with Cora so he's the star player and makes up for the fact that Mako and Cora are arguing and aren't as effective then the big moment happens and everyone is kind of against each other and they're awful as a team Bolin gets injured um Mako kind of loses kind of uh, hope kind of the team captain kind of goes down and it's Cora who's the one to kind of bring them all back you have them all kind of make their apologies and kind of just accept the fact that look look we got a bit too dramatic here we don't want this drama to get in the way of our kind of dreams our goals at this point in time we want to win this tournament and they kind of get going again and Cora Cora hits the hat trick gets them through to the final um, and they kind of fix their kind of issues you know you have you know you have Cora like apologize for maybe leading Bolin on a little bit on their date but like kind of showing that like she really likes being around him because he's so fun and you have the brothers kind of make up as well just kind of saying like like, we're not gonna get let something like this get between us like we've been together so close for so long we're not gonna let this mess up I think that episode is really good um I don't actually mind pro bending I know a lot of people tend to dislike it and I can sort of understand why in that it is a kind of not necessarily important plot point in the book that is given a decent amount of time and it's not really necessary and they maybe could have used that time elsewhere but I think it's really interesting to introduce a sport into the avatar world and I think the way they use it to kind of kind of highlight that here's Korra who has learned all this kind of traditional forms of bending what we know from ATLA she comes into this sport and is struggling because her style is kind of quite rooted in general and she hasn't adapted to air bending which would be a good style for pro bending and so she has to learn these kind of new quicker styles quick on your feet styles of bending really quickly to adapt to it so I think that's interesting uh, about kind of getting across the kind of more modern style of bending that pro bending kind of represents that it's quicker you have to be light on your feet it's more acrobatic and it's about kind of being you know using your attacks effectively and not just going for the crazy big attacks like was often the case in avatar so I I, I quite like that and then I think the tournament arc is interesting because you think they're basically just turning core into like a sports anime basically and then just as you think it's going to like just end in like a sports anime style thing of just like the heroes are defeated by cheaters and on the opposing team Amon comes in and it's a really cool moment in that kind of mid-season finale Amon makes his move comes in complete control master plan takes everyone out um, and basically gets this huge victory that this is the power that the equals have within the city and it's uh, great fight scenes you know like Lin and Korra fighting on the roof uh, crazy stuff it's, it's a great episode it's one of those episodes I forget is as good as it is episode six I believe and um, that's a really good episode as you get the sports part at the start and then just the, the amazingness as it comes in and 
you know, he takes out the wolf bats like three on one, and Amon does that. Great stuff. I really like that mid-season finale episode. Um, so yeah, there's that. Um, other missed opportunities. Um, there's there's obviously little things like you know this is the first book. Uh, I would have liked to have seen the air kids get a little bit more time. But I think that moment of just them coming in to help save like Lynn during the big attack on Air Temple Island uh, was a really cool moment just to give the kids all their kind of individual little moments. That was, for me, well done. I kind of liked Lynn's arc as well of just kind of going from being the one who was very annoyed with Korra to very much showing herself as like a character that she's selfless and even though she has these issues with like Tenzin that she's willing to sacrifice herself for him and his nation. That's that's her role. Her her duty is so important. They did a great job at actually turning that character around because Lynn is actually like quite dislikable in her first couple of appearances. And it's only once she begins to kind of see something in Korra in or around episode 6 in the tournament and then her, the, the two of them fighting together and her making her big sacrifice that she really turns around and kind of becomes one of the fan favourite characters. So... I think that is um, really well done. Um, a criticism I see some people bring up is that they were disappointed that there was no there was no fight between kind of Korra and Oman. That the fight that like they have in before that, like Korra and um, Mako against Oman, is kind of just them running away. It's more like them just fleeing from him. And then when Korra takes him out, it's just she does some airbending moves on him, and he's outed and runs off. I actually like that. I like that all that was needed to take down the Equalist movement was just showing the hypocrisy of the fact that the leader of the Equalist movement was a bender himself. And because of the way the people within that movement felt, they would just see a bender and be like, we've just followed someone who's completely wrong. And that's kind of what destroys the organization, just that it was founded on a lie, basically. And all that was needed was to show that to people him waterbending in public and after Korra has kind of you know hit him out the window is all that was needed I maybe you could have done a fight scene after that I would have liked to have seen uh, Amon do some kind of more standard non-blood bending uh, water moves and see how strong he is um but I think we know that he's super powerful and just that his plan has kind of been ruined at this point in time that as much as he has, he's a, he's opposed to Korra. It's not this blood feud between them. He just wants his movement to succeed, and kind of Korra is either for or against him, and will do what he needs to. But he knows, Amon knows, the second he bends in public, that um, the plan is over. There's the, the, that the the movement is over. There's nothing he can do after this point because who's going to believe him? He can try and take over the whole city himself, but then he's just a villain within the city, and that's that's not the the situation he needs so i think that's more or less everything i wanted to say here um i like that we got to see iroh that was cool he got a really cool uh sequence in the fights at the end uh, as the kind of biplanes came in um and i think i i do think that's about it there's some there's some really strong moments with cora early on as she kind of you deal with the fact that she's so wants to fight all the time and you have stuff like uh, 104 when you get that really emotional moment where she's kind of defeated by Amon but he kind of spares her and where she intends and he just uh, you have that moment where you see how much they care for each other so I'm going to end it there um, and just end by saying the next uh, Avatar Weekly Discussion Topic video is going to be my bottom five core episodes or like you know the top five worst core episodes that will be followed by the uh, bottom five or top five worst Avatar episodes. Then I'll do the Avatar The Last Airbender books, Missed Opportunities videos. And I'll end this kind of sequence of videos with top five uh, Korra episodes and top five Avatar episodes. So that's the plan for the next, basically, I think that's one, two, uh, that's seven videos coming. The next seven videos, that's the order I'll do them in. But uh, for now, I'll just end by saying uh, links to my Twitter and Tumblr in description below if you want to follow me on social media. Links to my Patreon page and my uh, PayPal donation link are in the description if you want to support my channel. Uh, so yeah, that's been the video. Thanks for watching and bye.